This is the Gould Standard, Episode 50, A Romance on Three Legs. Well, hello, and welcome to the Gould Standard. I'm Katie Hafner, and I am very honored, is the word, to be guest hosting for this episode about Glenn Gould and his uh, his um, finicky ways with pianos. And, uh, and the guest today is Jim Prosser, who, well, Jim, why don't you introduce yourself and then we'll get into how it is that you and I connected. Thanks for having me. It's wonderful to be here. My name is Jim Prosser. I'm a musician, pianist, educator, living in Shadow, Ontario. And uh, I happen to be the owner of a nice piano that's connected me to Mr. Gould. Surprisingly, I discovered this this spring. Now, we'll go into that a little later. Right? Yeah. Okay. So th- we, I got, I'm trying to remember how this happened. I got a, just an email over the transom from you a few months ago, right? And you said, you said, hi, you don't know me, but my name is... Jim Prosser and I own one of Glenn Gould's rejects. Is that yes, right? <laughs> that's exactly it. Yes, he uh, he he uh, tested this piano and didn't like it. And so, just to give listeners a little bit of background on how it is that you even thought to write to me, uh, I um, wrote a book uh, years ago. Actually, it turns out um, uh, it's vintage now. The book. Uh, and it's um, and the title is A Romance on Three Legs, Glenn Gould's Obsessive Quest for the Perfect Piano. This wonderful photograph of him, I had to pay for the rights to use this, and it was worth every penny. I just love this photograph so much of him sitting there in his scarf and his and his one of his gloves looking sort of like he's been hit by ennui in, uh, in a big way. And uh, Anyway, um, so I started researching the book, uh, uh, I guess in 2000, I don't even remember, maybe 2003, and it came out in 2008, and I spent a lot of time in the archives, uh, the Glen Gould Archives in Ottawa. And one of the mysterious figures in the story is this woman named Muriel Musson who was in charge, among other things, um, at Eaton, and is it called, Jim, is it called Eaton and Company? Eaton's. 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 So the department store, which back then, in the, we're talking the 1950s, 60s, um, had a full piano department. Um, The way now you get a whole floor of electronics, there would be a whole floor of pianos. And uh, because that's what people did back then, they had pianos. Um, And uh, and there were all these uh, concert pianists who would come through and they would need a piano to play. And uh, and so she would assign these pianos to uh, that that Eaton had in stock in its concert uh, department. that were designated for these visiting pianists. And uh, so goes the story. And maybe what I should do, (laughs) I was just looking at it this morning. I'll just read this. So here we've got, we've set it up now. We've got Muriel Muriel Musson, who, by the way, I could never find. I looked and looked and looked for her. And Jim, I think you did too, uh, because she's such an intriguing figure. Um, Miss Musson, so I'm assuming she never married. Um, and um, and then we've got Gould, Glenn Gould, who was constantly looking for the perfect piano. He's unbelievable. He would he was to to Steinway's great consternation. He um, Steinway the company and Henry Steinway, who he dealt with personally. Um, so I'm gonna, just going to read this because this is the piano that we are going to be discussing today is CD uh, 131. Um, 
Although Gould no longer had to contend with the vagaries of catch-as-catch-can pianos, the ripple effects of Steinway's decline in quality were evident to him as well. Someone recorded one of Gould's several forays to Eaton's, where he did brief ad hoc performances while trying out several of their newer instruments and offered a running critique of the modern Steinway. On CD-131, otherwise known as the Musson Special, presumably because it was a piano Muriel Musson had foisted on a great many visiting performers, he played a little Bach and some Strauss and pronounced the piano's action, quote, very sluggish, even heavy and cumbersome. And warming to his material, he said this, but it's also very even, so it's evenly sluggish. The piano, he went on to complain, lost its tuning very quickly. It has even gone out of tune, quote, it has even gone out of tune the two minutes I've been playing on it. So that's uh, CD-131, which you are actually sitting at this very moment. That's right. I was, may I explain how I contacted you? I would love to hear how you acquired this piano. My wife and I are both musicians, and uh, a friend of hers recommended your book, and I'd heard of your book, but didn't have it. So right away, I downloaded a Kindle copy and was reading through it and enjoy it quite, because once you're a piano person, I understand Gould's perspective that way. I thought he was a bit quirky with what he liked, but nevertheless. Then I was reading this chapter, and I came across, and I said, that's my piano <laughs> that he's dissing, that's, which is fine. And, and it's fine. In fact, I was always curious, why did you use the John Foist? It's, that's a, has, that has a pejorative meaning, because it must have been a good piano for them to hear and want, right? Why well, did you use Oh, amazing. Okay, so you already owned the piano. It's not like you thought, oh, I'm going to go find this, no. this Musson special. Okay, so tell, tell me how you came upon okay. the piano. Okay, so... Uh, this piano uh, was purchased by University of Western Ontario, as it was called then, probably in the late 70s, 78, 79. The reason I know that is because the head technician, Don Stevenson, with whom I became great friends and still am, um, he arrived there as the head technician at the Faculty of Music in 1980. And when he arrived there, there was this piano, which was called the New Steinway, even though it was older than their other Steinway. So they had two, this, this one was purchased. Uh, because they wanted a better concert instrument. And they had another Steinway, which was actually a little newer. This one was built in 1969. That's its date of manufacture. So, And these are the years that, the very years that Gould was complaining about when he thought that the the quality of the Steinway pianos was really suffering, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, see, well, so this was built in 69. In the 70s, they were experimenting with, I I think, different things like uh, Teflon bushings, et cetera. Right, right. And things Nevertheless, they were still building fine pianos, and they're all different because they're also handcrafted. So when Don arrived in 1980, they called this the new Steinway, even if it was older. He immediately changed the names. He said, we're going to call it Tristan or Isolde, and this one became Isolde after the operatic care because he didn't want them. someone saying, I want to play the new Steinway, and they would forget which one was which, and I think that's why. And he tried to keep this one, I think, exclusively for faculty, visiting guests, maybe graduate students who were playing. So they got to play on the better piano. I first played it in 1986 when I was giving a recital at Von Christian Hall, and Don was there, and he said, do you want to play 131? And I said, sure. You've told me that it's a great piano. So I went in and did, I played them both, and it was just unbelievably better. And any time I played there, uh, whether I was doing collaborative work, or sometimes I did give solo recitals more than as well. I always chose this piano because it was wonderful. And they kept it in tip-top shape. It was always well, in tip-top shape. Hold on. Shape. So what, what did you like about it when you were playing it? So what I liked about it was, interestingly enough, it had a very even and light action. Not ha uh-huh. inco- So heavy not inco- sluggish. Not, not even heavy, evenly and, sluggish. As, well, we'll talk some more about that, why that would be. But I like that. I also loved the way it was. It just sang, especially in the treble. It would really, really sing. It had a lovely bass. Basses are easier to get on bigger pianos, but the treble is making them sing and, and making them sing evenly as they go up. That's something that's special. That has so much to do with who's looking after the piano. And, that, and I, you know, so I suspect that when Gruel encountered it, it was not in a tip top shape. Mm-hmm. So, you meaning it had been 
neglected? Or well, I don't not? think it necessarily had been neglected, but he planted it on, I think the date was March 11th, 1976. And this, that's Wait, how do you know it was March 11th, 1976? Because that's what, that's what the recording in the archives dates. It's dated March 11th, 1976. I remember dates, horrible with names, dates, music, numbers, I remember that. Um, uh, this piano was, probably went to Toronto in 1969 or 1970. That meant it had six years of heavy playing at Eaton Auditorium and at Massey Hall and wherever it was moved. Lots of playing. I, who knows? I've always wondered who could have played this piano. Lots well, of we, people. Yeah, we know Myra Hess, right? Or we yep. think maybe she yep. did. Yeah, I um, think so. Uh, and I, I, I don't know who else. I'd have to go back and look through the book. But yeah. yeah. Um, so, so lots of people would have played it. And who knows how well it was maintained. I know that you know they, they would have had it tuned regularly, but things wear out. And after shall we say six or seven years of heavy playing, the hammers would be worn, the action would, might have been uneven, and you have to lubricate actions. I lubricate the actions of my two grands twice a year to keep them running smoothly, and, and then there's voicing and all those other things. So who knows? And I suspect that it probably didn't have the attention. One thing is because they, they were getting new piano. In fact, wasn't he testing it with another newer Steinway to... To, I don't remember the number of the newer one he was testing. So it might have just not been in the ideal of condition at that point, having been played so much. So then, but the way you it even got into your proximity was that Eaton's, I assume, would would take these pianos and kind of retire them and send them out into the yes, and, into and, the world. and they'd sell them. So Western, I guess, was looking for a new, better instrument as to have as their principal piano, and someone there. I, I mean, I knew the piano factory were that probably thought this was a good piano, as it is. It's a great piano. And and purchased it. And it was their primary piano for well over a decade. Wow. Well, well I mean, up until I think the late 1990s. And then they bought another one and it became used for, for still, it was on stage at Von Christer Hall. They had three, I think, at one point. But time came in, it was 2004 and I contacted Don Stevenson and I I had two grants at the time, but I wanted to upgrade. Uh, and I said, if you ever get a nice Steinway, and I was thinking of a good L, which is about six feet, or a B, which is six foot eight. I said, if you get a good L or a B, I said, I'd love to, I'd, I'd love to consider it. I might just buy. He said, okay, just leave it with me. And then, you know, weeks and months went by, and one evening I was teaching, and my phone rang, and it was Don, and he said, he called me Jimmy. He's one of the few people I let call me Jimmy because he's a great tutor. Um, <laughs> So he said, what would you say if I said you could maybe buy 131? And I thought, oh, my God, that's way more piano than I need. And I also, my oldest son was going off to university in Australia, and I had two more sons coming down the pipeline for post-secondary education. Oh, so more, you're more piano than you need in and size more money, or at in, so and more in size and expense, you know, both. And I thought, then I thought for a minute, ah. Sure, I said, if it came up I'll, and it comes up on a sale because they had an annual musical instrument sale, I'll make an offer and we'll see what we see. As it turns out, on May the 1st, 2004, I bought the piano. I was very lucky. And how much did you pay, may I ask? Uh, just under $50,000 Canadian at that time. And is that considered a good deal? I don't know. It's only money. <laughs> Yeah, and also because uh, it's a my, piano. It's, it's all it's I'll ever need. Exactly, it's a piano, and it's this is a this is actually by now a famous piano. Well, back then it wasn't famous. It's just my piano, and it's always just been my piano. It's amazing. as it will continue to be. It's just an instrument. Okay, the fact that Gould didn't like it is just hilarious and not surprising, but that's fine. Okay, so let's get to this: uh, the question of action. Uh, and because I discuss it quite a bit in the book and his preference, um, <clears throat> which he expressed uh, very strongly for uh, very, very light action. As Vern Edquist, his longtime tuner, said, G Glenn would like it if the piano played itself. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, so here's what the is thing. Your, uh -huh. uh, a lighter action or heavy action doesn't mean they're sluggish. My other grant has a significantly heavier action, 
and I want it that way. I want my I want to practice also on something with more weight, but it's free and even, and it plays just as intricately as well. It's just that you don't you don't this plays a little more easily because of the lighter action. And I don't think a concert people going to a, a play in a concert venue want to to work with a piano that has more weight. Lighter is better. But that's the way Steinway D's are set up. At least every one that I've ever played, I've never come across a heavy Steinway D, either in New York or Hamburg, ever. They've always been lighter. Okay, so let's assume that this action is is light, but then what do, what do you think he meant by sluggish? Well, what I think by sluggish is that it was out of regulation, and it might have needed some lubricating. So, so uh, back then, lubricating was more much more time consuming. If you wanted to lubricate the knuckles, at least what I used, used was taught to do by Dong, you had to rub talc into the knuckles. You had to put graphite on top of the jacks and on top of the whippings. But, but nowadays, we use liquid silicone that doesn't collect any dust, and you can lubricate every moving part on an action, which I do, as I mentioned, a couple of times a year on pianos. And they keep them running smoothly and evenly, and you have to keep them well-regulated and voiced. As, you know, voicing, is, as you know, is a separate thing. But mechanically, it's a machine, and like any machine, it needs maintenance, regular maintenance. And it's been my experience that a, hall, a piano gets in a hall or in halls, and it says Steinway, it has three legs, there you go. And, you know, it isn't often well looked after. And I suspect that's maybe what he encountered in 76. Well, maybe. So was he just dismissive of it? Couldn't he have said to um, Vern at the time, uh, this needs uh, regulating, this needs lubricating, this needs... Oh, absolutely, he could have probably said that. But it seems to me this was just a... I don't want to say a gimmick. It wasn't a gimmick. He was just trying out two pianos, and I don't think he ever, I don't know, maybe he would have been delighted if he'd come across another one that was as good as his damage 318 was at that point in time. Yeah. But, well, um, now, that you, now that you mentioned 318, and also don't let me forget to come back to this topic of technicians, because I really, I think that so, they are so uh, kind of under appreciated. I have more to well tell understood. you about this piano and what was done to it, but anyway, carry mm -hmm. on. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, let's do that first. Let's talk about this piano and what was done to okay. it, and and the and let's hereby honor uh, kind of a good, get the whole idea of a of a technician like Vern, and now I'm assuming Don. Yes. They can really work wonders, oh, right? unbelievable what they can do. So I asked Don, because after I talked to you, I I, I wrote to him. He's retired now, although he's living in Newfoundland in Canada. Uh, he still comes back to Ontario and does work. I, I wrote to him. I said, so what was the piano like when you first encountered it? And he said, oh, so bright. It was just so bright. Um, and that's an indication that it, the hammers had just been played and played and played and were very hard, you know. So I said, what did you do to it over the time that you were there, the 20-some years you were there? He said, well, we, we rebuilt the action twice. Aha. Uh -huh. So the actions we, and what does it what does that entail when you rebuild? Well, when action? they would have rebuilt an action, I assume they would have put in, they would have rebushed the keys, the, the, so the, the tipping point on the keys that bushing would have been replaced. But everything else, whippings, hammers, shanks, would have been replaced with new, brand new, and regulated. And they would have done. He said we did that twice. We also restrung it once. He recalls. So it has a second set oh, of re -strung strings. Restrung it. Yeah, oh. also restrung. And, and the reason I, I know that is because uh, Steinway used uh, a, a certain size tuning pin, I think, 0.282 inches was the original factory Steinway tuning pin. This one has a, about 290, slightly larger, which indicates that it's, it has been restrung, but it's the original tuning block. It's still the original pin block and original soundboard, of course, because that's the voice of the piano. So it had, he replaced they rebuilt the action two times to keep it in top shape. Um, that's when I acquired it in 2004. In 2019, so I mean, I played a lot, but nothing like it would have been played. I had new, a whole new set of Steinway hammers installed on it. So it's had its third or fourth set of hammers. That took about a year and a half for that piano to come, for this to come back. And I remember he, I would be voicing it and be get frustrated with the sound because it wasn't what I remembered. And then one day I sat down to play it and I heard it. And I said, wow, that's the piano I remember from the 80s. And it's back to the way, it, to me, it's the way it was. So they changed. They can change so much. And with a, 
with the excellent technicians. And Don was the head of a big a team that did a remarkable work at Western then. Um, uh, uh, they just kept this piano and the old pianos in remarkably fine shape. Well, it sounds to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds to me like you're describing a piano that morphed into something Gould might not have recognized. Yes, as the one absolutely. Well, but I, let, let me ask yeah. you this kind of really basic question, but is there something intrinsic in the bones of a piano that make it what it is? Um, to me, obviously, it's the soundboard. It's going to be the thing that makes it. It's the grain of the soundboard, how tight that is. And actions can be dealt with and hammers. You can do all sorts of things. That They're all variables. The ultimate thing that's going to make a piano sound great is the soundboard and the construction of all that. So that's the center, um, you know, the belly of the piano that has to be right. And it, some of them are just greater than others. And you, you hear those differences all the time, you know, um, to me, I think that's what it is. And this one has it. Um, I hear harmonics in this piano, and perhaps we'll talk about why I hear harmonics, but I hear more harmonics in this piano than I do in lots of others that I play. Uh, and why do, why do you think that is? Well, I think what is because it, it, it generates more sound and a more, I think it generates a more complex sound. There's more of this background sound. I remember Mr. Edquist, I heard him say that he heard Maria Callas sing and he heard three harmonics in her voice. You know, he was able to hear harmonics even with someone singing. Um, so pianos are made up of harmonics. You know, that's that's the background I, well, sound. I was talking to Vern once uh, and I was backing my car up. We were talking on the phone and he heard that backup beat yes. or, or something like that. And he, and he heard harmonics. <laughs> yeah, so he... <laughs> he he had an amazing ear. Yeah. Um, uh, so um, let's so let's uh, talk about what it is about your repertoire and the music you like to play that makes you particularly fond of this piano. Well, I'm just your run the mill classical pianist. I play Bach, Handel's, Rameau. You know that's. I don't go back to Sveli and others like that so much. Um, and I play lots of Beethoven, Chopin, Liszt, Rachmaninoff, Brahms. Brahms is so wonderful. Um, Schubert, I might play some Schubert for you today, actually. Um, so this piano works in all of those styles. It just it works. It sounds beautiful in all those, like any good piano would. You can, you can make the thing come to life. It has an enormously huge sound far bigger than, than the room in which I have it can really hold. You know, people can hear it out of the street, but it's the colors that it has. It's the, the depth of the sound, the singing quality of the treble, and this, this spectrum of color that I hear when I play. Um, and and uh, that's really what makes this piano wow. for me work. And it, wow. and it plays, plays so beautifully and easily. Wow. Lucky you. You know, I have to tell you, I was, I was in, I live in San Francisco, but I was in London a couple of weeks ago and uh, my husband and I went to a recital. One thing they're doing at, um, it's called uh, uh, <clears throat> um, St. Mary's Church. It's um, fascinating. They're spending a year going through all of the Bach preludes and fugues. And they're, once a month, a visiting concert pianist comes and, and plays two of them, but builds a program of his or her choosing around that. And wow. then when we... The one I know, and the one we happened to luck into was um, uh, Sam uh, Haywood. Lovely, lovely. Oh my gosh. And we were sitting in this tiny little church. Um, I think it's uh, St. Mary's in the Strand. Um, if you ever get a chance to go to London, it's it's only going for a few months more. But anyway, um, and it's such an intimate, it makes me think of your living room a little bit. It's this very intimate space. And we were right there in the second pew because we were in a church. And uh, he was playing and I was looking at the piano and it, um, it's a it's a B, a Steinway B. And he, I thought to myself, I always think now, I think, what does he think of the piano? And so I went up to... Um, this lovely woman who, with her husband, runs this this series, uh, 
And she said, um, uh, and she's a soprano. They're both musicians. Her husband's a pianist. And she said that her husband had always wanted to own a Steinway. Um, and he, when he finally bought this B, he didn't want to put it in his house. He wanted to share it with the world. And so he donated it, basically. I could be getting this story wrong. And I hope Susan, who was is the person I talked to, um, he wanted to share it with the world, so he donated it to the church, uh, and they have all these recitals and uh, coming through. And I keep thinking, and I said to her, uh, "Well, what do the p- pianists think of this particular piano?" And she said, "They all love it." And I thought to myself, "How remarkable!" Because you're when you're when you're a concert pianist, you are so at the mercy of the piano they give you, right? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Which is why I guess Horowitz traveled with his piano. Horowitz right? and lots of others just traveled. Horowitz, the pianist Anton Coretti from Canada did as well. Uh, they just, I studied piano with uh, Margaret Parsons, Clifford Poole. They were a piano duo team. They recorded for Columbia. They used to tow two Steinway bees around in a converted horse trailer all over North America to give concerts because they couldn't depend upon pianos being okay. And that would match. Yeah. Yeah. That's just what they did. I mean, you think about a violinist can just, you know, carry their instrument. And I had, until I started working on the book, I, I hadn't even fully appreciated that this, and I'm sure that it had, that must've had a, a real bearing. I mean, there were many reasons that Gould gave up, concertizing. Um, but one of them must have been the terrible tragedy that befell CD318 when he was traveling with it to Cleveland. It got dropped. Um, I'm kind of giving the book away, but um, I can imagine that if this happened to your cherished CD131, you would, um, you'd be crushed, right? If well, yes, yes, and no. I'm going to tell you, Katie, it's it's a glorious piano, and I am very fortunate to have been able to work enough to be able to have afforded it and keep it in great shape and be able to play it every day that I want. But ultimately, in all, there are other great pianos around. If this one, I would be very upset. I would regret it, but I'd find another. I would. Mm-hmm. I, I would. What yeah. do you think, speaking of other pianos, what do you think, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about CD318, what do you think Steinway's golden years were? Many people say it was between the world wars. or Is that kind of an old wives' tale, or is that? Yeah. No, I don't, I don't think that was necessarily the case. I think that there was, they're, still, they're still making great pianos. I still think they are, spe- specifically in Hamburg, um, where, I think they're making remarkably wonderful pianos, and I think great pianos are still coming out of New York. Although I, I've had no contact with New New Yorks very, very much. Uh, all I know is pianos that I've played that were built in the forties, fifties, sixties, even into the seventies. I've played some duds and some great ones as well. I mean, I they're 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 so in they're so much individuals, Katie, that I don't think you can generally say that that quality has necessarily gone down because they're just so different. I mean, they're different in every respect. There's another Steinway D in, our, in my city in Chatham. Uh, we were using it for master classes with students. And I don't know what happened. Someone had broken the desk on it. And I thought, well, that's crazy. So I offered, I said, I'll bring it home and repair it for you. I'll put my desk in yours in place. My desk wouldn't fit. The pianos were different enough that you couldn't even slide my desk into that other Steinway. Wow. Mine, was, mine was too big. And it just reminded me of this. Well, of course, that's why they all have numbers on them for every part, so that the case and all the parts stay together because they're each unique. They're each unique. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting story. Um, in fact, so we know uh, that at the end of his life, uh, Glenn Gould, um, he couldn't find a piano to replace his beloved 318, and he migrated to a Yamaha. Uh, and I was on the phone again with with um with uh, Vern once, and my daughter was practicing in the other room, and he heard it, and he said, 
Katie, what is your daughter doing? What are you doing with a Yamaha? <laughs> and how how did he know that? I I just how could he tell? I was astounded by that. They have, pianos have a distinctive sound. Uh -huh. What size? What was it? A grand? Or was I'm it vertical? forgetting at that point. This was years and years ago. Mm -hmm. What we had, um, yeah, it was a grand. I just okay. don't know. Uh, how so it, it wasn't huge. No. Okay. So yeah, it was probably a brighter piano. So Yamaha, in order to, this is again, I found this. This is Don Stevenson telling me this because I find Yamahas they're lovely pianos. I think they're lovely pianos, very well made pianos. But I find their smaller grands to be too bright for my taste. I love I love a, a bit of a darker sound because I live with this thing. Um, uh, but I asked Don. I said, "Why are they all generally dark?" However, I said, "I do like their big pianos. They're seven foots, the C7, and their their concert grands." He said, "Ah, it's because they they, in order to produce more smaller grands, they cool the the iron plate, the steel plate, in vacuum." and it cools more quickly, and therefore when you cool iron more quickly, it's harder, and it emphasizes harder iron will also help reverberate higher frequencies, making a piano brighter. The bigger pianos, they let them naturally cool, so the iron in them is just a little bit, not as hard, it's just soft, I wouldn't say soft, but it's not as hard and brittle, therefore it has a warmer sound. So he might have heard your piano and said, oh, that's, he wouldn't would be able to hear that. Pianos who play a lot, you can hear certain pianos a lot if you're around them enough. Yeah. And people, Yamahas are, are ubiquitous now, and people are starting to believe that's the sound of pianos. I've had people come and not like the sound of this because they say, I find it a bit dark. I said, oh, yeah, I can understand that. And that's fine. You know, it's just what you get used to and what you like to control. Oh, that's very interesting. So he, at the end of his life, um, had not one but bought not one but two Yamahas. Yeah, that's right. He bought um, two, didn't he? And that's what he played the second uh, Goldberg Variations on yes. one of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, uh, and backing up, uh, um, before I uh, ask you to play, uh, let's talk about uh, his beloved CD318. I'm looking for um, the, the passage in the book where he where he actually discovers it. Um, so it goes on and on and on about how he's driving, um, he's driving uh, Steinway absolutely out of their minds. And they said, I think one of them at one point said, you know, he needs to go to a, he needs to go to a shrink. Uh, oh, and then he, there was this whole thing with his chickering. Um, and then he, so then he discovers, finally, finally, finally discovers CD318, which is this shabby piano that Eaton's had been planning to send back to New York and it had been shunted off in a corner of the Eaton Auditorium. Uh, and he sat down, he played it, and he loved it so much. And he said to Miss Musson, and I loved it when I found this in the, in the archives because I've been looking and looking and looking for a title. I had all these, for the book, I had all these terrible titles. I mean, too embarrassing even to tell you what, Book titles are hard, and this I think I had something like, oh gosh, this is embarrassing, but I'll confess, something like The Prodigy's Keys. or So, oh, oh. so I'm in the archives. I see this um, interview that someone had done with Miss Musson, and she said to the interviewer, yes, when Mr. Gould discovered CD318, he said to me, Miss Musson, <laughs> This is the first time in history where there has been a romance on three legs. And I said to myself, thank you, God, title. And, uh, and he, but he really felt that way. He really felt that way about the piano. He absolutely um, loved it. Then to everyone's horror, the piano got dropped and it could, and it could, and it was never satisfactorily repaired. And there's this one great scene where where uh, Gould and, and Vern Edquist kind of sneak the, they take out the action and they sneak it across the yes. border <laughs> in, his, in Gould's big car. Uh, and uh, 
and it's still it's to take it to Steinway, basically um, a, as an inpatient. But no luck. It's very sad. Um, well, the action, even the action, Katie, he could have gotten the action exactly the way he wanted it. But the rest of the piano wasn't the same anymore. They had to put a new new plate and everything in it. I don't know if they put a new board. Whether the board had been damaged, the plate was what cracked in four or five places. Yes, right, so right, the, right. The board may have been damaged too, and that's really what's going to make the difference between that thing. You know, actions you can work with them and pimp them out and make them play the way you want, but you, you can't do that with the rest of the piano. And I grew so fond of him while I was uh, of Gould and Vern. There are three main characters in the book. There's uh, Glenn Gould, Vern Edquist, and the piano. And um, and I really fell in love with all three of them. I mean, in their own funny ways. And so when I think about it, I think, you know, Gould, he was such a special case uh, in so many ways. And for him to have experienced that kind of damage, it was almost as if it he was physically damaged himself. Do you think that's a, is that kind of an exaggeration? Uh, I think, I, I think that for in his case, no, that's not an exaggeration. But at the same time, he was capable of playing other pianos and playing them beautifully. You know, when he made the recording of the Eroica with the TS in 1970, when he was filling in, you know, they, you remember? He was just playing on CBC Steinway, I think that they still have. He, and... Uh, I remember this, watching an interview with Mr. Edquist. He got a call to go over and check out piano, tune it up. I got to play this one. And he played it. He, he was able to adapt and play that beautifully. He would never have known, you know, that he, he so he, he certainly had a, the wherewithal to, to manage all those things and never let on. But I suppose in the, in the world that he was, in which he was recording and living in this other more intimate world, that piano was the thing that gave him, only gave him what he wanted and needed. And I, I think and so, so kind of princess and the pea like, and so, so he, he. One of my favorite stories about him is that um, he went to a hotel once and called down at the desk to the desk at three in the morning, demanding a new act, a new uh, a new mattress, and uh, and then he the the he met with the um, the reporter. This was a profile that was written of him in the New Yorker. And he said, I didn't sleep well. The mattress, bad action. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of, of course. course, right? Of course, yes. So let's talk about what you are going to play for us on, um, on your lovely Gould Reject. You, you mentioned um, when we were speaking about something that would require lightness, um, and so I, I want to have something that shows both singing quality and also lightness. So I've chosen a Schubert impromptu, Opus 90, number three in G flat major, because it has beautiful singing melody, resonant bass, but this light, intricate accompaniment in the lower right hand that, that, that I mean, I, I can play it on my other piano just very comfortably too, but it works so much more easily here. So that's what I was going to play, um, just so you could have a, a sample of that. And it isn't all that long, I think five, five and a half minutes. Something oh, like that. that sounds that sounds just lovely. Um, so that's the plan. Can I tell you one more thing about hearing harmonics? Um, so uh, in 1996, I actually lost my hearing. I went deaf. I, I, I experienced something called sudden sensory neural hearing loss. Oh my god! Yes, and I was profoundly deaf. I could hear nothing. But suddenly, heard, just suddenly, I woke up one morning deaf. Um, uh, a virus apparently attacked my ears. Um, I'm very lucky that my hearing came back. I, I was living in London at the time. I got great medical care, but it was just probably a virus that attacked my ears. The, uh, I was on high doses of prednisone to reduce inflammation because when it first happened, I thought my eyeballs were going to get pushed out of my head. And I couldn't hear anything for several weeks. I had a big studio of students, well, several weeks, more than that, longer than that. But after about two months, I went. I used to go to the piano every day and play a big chord. I, and I didn't know this piano then, but... I went to my piano, played a big chord, and one day I heard a tick. I heard this, like a click when I played a big chord. It was the first outside sound I'd heard. And then gradually, 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 my hearing came back, highest frequencies down to the lowest. 
So I could only hear very, very, very high frequency. So if a car went by, all I heard was squealing. And then when I got so I could hear people's voices, it sounded like they were all breathing helium. Um, but eventually I could hear everything, although I've been left with tinnitus. I do have tinnitus. And I also have a very, a very sensitive to harmonics. I hear harmonics now more than I ever did before. And when, I, um, when my hearing recovered, I remember uh, I went back to Fall Christopher Hall and I gave a benefit recital for the Canadian Hearing Society. And I played on this piano again, it was still there. And it sounded even more colorful than I remembered it being before. And, it, and I didn't, didn't think about it so much then until afterwards, uh, you know, a few days afterwards, I realized, oh, it's because I hear differently now. And I hear harmonics in this in pianos more than I ever did before, but especially this one. It's like a painting of Monet's going on while I'm playing at times. So do you consider this um, sensitivity to harmonics uh, a blessing or a curse? It's a bit of both. <laughs> if a piano is not voiced well or is too bright, oh, man, it just kills me to listen to them. You know, so uh, a, a bright piano that needs a voicing just makes me crazy. So uh, it can be a bit of a curse, but ultimately I think it might be a bit of a, a blessing. And how did... How does the tinnitus affect your um, your music? It it doesn't affect. So here, some people have a terrible time with tinnitus. For me, after having been deaf, tinnitus is a small price to pay for being able to hear and being able to be a musician. Um, in fact, I don't even hear my tinnitus until I start talking about it. So I I hear it now. It's like some white noise in the background. But most of the time, I don't even hear it unless I get tired. It gets louder when I, if I'm overtired, and then I'll hear it. But generally speaking, it's fine. And I've been deaf. So um, after that, nothing's as bad. Like it, nothing is as isolating and crazy as that. But that's another reason why I love this piano. I hear these harmonics better than I ever did before. It's crazy. My goodness, what a story.
That was lovely. So tell us again why you chose this piece. So that was Schubert's Impromptu in G flat major, opus 19, number three. Um, the reason I chose that is because I wanted to show all the piano singing. Now, it doesn't go very high, I get that, but it, it really is able to create a beautiful singing line on the top of the right hand. Clear, beautiful bass, because the bass has some intricate stuff to do very, very low, um, which on Schubert's piano wouldn't have been so hard to keep clear. On here, we have to be careful with flatter pedaling and stuff. And it has that intricate, fast moving middle accompaniment that's so easy to control on this piano. It's just beautiful to control. And it feels so good. The more black notes, the better, right? Did you just say the more black keys, the better? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Well, on that note, so to speak, uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed this. I'm so glad you wrote to me out of the blue. Thank you so much for doing that. And thank you so much to the Glenn Gould Foundation for letting us sort of pop in as, as interlopers. This has been so fun. So fun. It's been hilariously fun. Thank you. Thank you for your care. Thank you, Katie. Take care. The Glenn Gould Foundation is a registered Canadian charity and we rely on the support of arts lovers like you to keep bringing inspiring stories to life. Please consider giving by visiting our website, glengould.ca, and follow us across social media at the Glenn Gould Foundation. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of The Gould Standard.